This glass is brittle right now. Today, it's brittle, but it's not breaking. It's not, you know, shattering into pieces, but that's because no one has punched it. Today's lecture is about a theory of mind called behaviorism. Behaviorism is a theory of the human mind. Specifically, it's a version of physicalism. It's a version of the theory that everything in the universe, including human minds, is physical stuff, the type of thing that is studied by physics. That's physicalism. The theory that everything, including the human mind, is made up of physical stuff. Physicalism is mainly contrasted, at least in this course, with dualism. Dualism was Descartes' theory. It's the theory that there's two kinds of stuff in the universe. There's the mental stuff, and there's the physical stuff. The mental stuff is what thinks or has consciousness, and the physical stuff is, you know, what's extended in space and located in space. Okay, so you'll remember from our discussion of Descartes, there was a problem with dualism, and the problem was it seemed impossible that these two kinds of things, such different things, uh, the non-material, non-extended mind and the material extended body, it seems impossible that they could ever causally interact with one another. But Descartes thinks that they do. That problem, of course, was due to Princess Elizabeth. That was Princess Elizabeth's problem. If you think that that problem is really serious, you might look for an alternative to dualism, which is physicalism, the idea that the mind is just some of the physical stuff. If the mind is made up entirely of particles, physical particles, then it's not mysterious how the mind could move the body because the mind just is some bodily stuff. But if you go the physicalist route, you then have an obvious question that arises, which is, okay, so the mind is physical, which physical stuff is it? And that is what behaviorism is an answer to. Behaviorism specifies some of the events or things in the physical world and says those, that's what the mind is. That's what mental activity is. It's those physical events. Specifically, of course, behavioral events. And by behavior, we mean outwardly observable movements. So, you know, when I like lift this marker up and down or I flap my lips around and sound waves move, that's all of my behavior. It's stuff that other people can see. It's important to note at this point, and this will be uh, a relevant big deal later, that behavior is outwardly observable. Like anyone can watch my behavior and, and you might know more about how I move my hand, right? Like, you know, how many inches up or down it goes. You might know more about that than I do, right? Because, you know, I can measure how much my hand moves and you can measure it. There's nothing private about my behavior. That is in contrast with Descartes' view. On Descartes' view, the mental was private. Like what you really think or what you feel, that's something that you know more intimately than other people know. That was a component part of at least Descartes' version of the dualist theory of mind. Okay, so now we understand all of that. We understand that behaviorism is a version of physicalism. We understand that it's in opposition to the dualist theory of mind. And for today, we read an article by David Armstrong. Actually, we didn't read an article by David Armstrong. We read a selection from an old book of his, um, and it was sort of re reformed as an article. Armstrong is not a behaviorist. Uh, however, Armstrong does a really, really good job summarizing behaviorism, and so for our course, we are just using his summary of behaviorism as the statement of the theory that we're going to assess and consider and criticize and whatever. Here's what Armstrong says as a sort of initial presentation of the behaviorist theory of mind. Uh, if you're following along in the reading, this was on page 296. The mind was not something Oh, uh, he's talking in the past tense about a previous presentation of the behaviorist theory of mind. That's why he used the word was. The mind was not something behind the behavior of the body. 
it was simply part of that physical behavior. My anger with you, which is an example of a state of, of the mind, my anger with you is not some modification of a spiritual substance which somehow brings about aggressive behavior. Rather, it is the aggressive behavior itself. My addressing strong words to you, striking you, turning my back on you, and so on. Those are all examples of anger behavior, the behavior that's typically associated with anger. And the claim of this initial version of behaviorism is that anger just is shouting and turning your back and, and punching you or whatever. Then we get another example immediately after that. Thought is not an inner process that lies behind and brings about the words I speak and write. It is my speaking and writing. The mind is not an inner arena. It is outward act. There you go. When I have some thought or belief, we normally think of that thought or belief as being expressed or revealed, causing my words to come out of my mouth. But the claim of this initial version of behaviorism is, no, the words just are the thought or the belief. That's it. Okay, so it should be clear why this initial version of behaviorism that Armstrong sketches definitely is a version of physicalism, right? If anger just is punching and yelling, well, punching and yelling are things in the physical world. And so, on this theory, anger is part of the physical world. But this initial version of behaviorism is just obviously false. Like, there's an obvious counterexample to it. And Armstrong points this out, like, two sentences after presenting this version of behaviorism. If you'd like a refresher on what a counterexample is, I have another video that hopefully I've edited by now, um, and it just explains what a counterexample is and how philosophers use them in philosophical argument, and I will put a link to that in the description. Here is Armstrong destroying, easily, this initial version of behaviorism. However, the version of behaviorism that I have just sketched is a very crude version, and its crudity lays it open to obvious objections. One obvious difficulty is that it is our common experience that there can be mental processes going on, although there is no behavior occurring that could possibly be treated as expressions of these processes. A man, or a woman, or any person with a mind may be angry, but give no bodily sign. He may think, but say or do nothing at all. There you go, that's the counterexample. Let me just write out the simple version of behaviorism and explain how the counterexample worked really quick. Here's a, a sort of claim that this initial crude version of behaviorism might make. Anger is punching, or yelling, or whatever. Well. We can think of a scenario where someone feels genuine anger. They really and truly are anger. This is a state of their mind. But nonetheless, they don't punch or yell or do anything like that. So you have an example, a counterexample, where you've got one, one thing, anger, but you don't have the other thing, the behavior. So this initial crude version of behaviorism is false. What Armstrong does next is he presents a more sophisticated version of behaviorism. But if we're going to understand this more sophisticated version of behaviorism, we have to understand what a dispositional property or a dispositional characteristic is. A disposition is a tendency. Okay, I need an example of a characteristic of something that is dispositional. Namely, that characteristic consists in some tendency of the object. Take, for example, this glass. Right, the board that I'm writing on, this light board here, um, this is made of glass. One of the characteristics of the glass is that it is brittle. But what is brittleness? Well, brittleness is just the characteristic of being disposed to break if put under a certain amount of pressure, to shatter. This glass is brittle right now. Today, it's brittle. But it's not breaking, it's not, you know, shattering into pieces, but that's because no one has punched it. If I were to, to, I would wrap my hand in something maybe before I did it, but if I were to punch this glass hard enough, and if I weren't worried about hurting my hand, 
I could punch this glass probably hard enough. I'm not that strong, but probably. I could break the glass. If the glass were put under a certain amount of pressure, then it would shatter. So it's brittle. But this is true of the glass even if the glass never breaks. Right, so like, what's the story of this glass? I don't know, some glass folks made it in a glass factory one day, right? And then it got shipped here and assembled in this room. Um, and then it lived its whole life and I rode on it all the time with these like fancy, sh you know, neon markers. And then maybe one day I bring it back to a glass recycling place and they melt it down. And it never shatters in its whole life. Nonetheless, that whole time, it was still brittle. It was brittle even though it never broke because the characteristic of being brittle depends only on the glass having that disposition. And something can have the disposition or the tendency to shatter even if it never actually shatters. Okay, so now we understand what a disposition is. Armstrong explains this same idea, by the way, on page 297. Here's what he says. A piece of glass may never shatter or break throughout its whole history, but it is still the case that it is brittle. It is liable to shatter or break if dropped quite a small way or hit quite lightly. Now, a disposition to behave is simply a tendency or liability of a person to behave in a certain way under certain circumstances. What Armstrong is saying there is certain characteristics of people are dispositional characteristics, right? Some people are easy to anger. They're excitable. Someone who's excitable in this way is someone who like, if you say one little thing to them, they explode in rage or whatever, right? And it's true of this person that they're excitable even if on that particular day they don't explode. They don't, they don't act out. It's even if they go through the whole day without, without freaking out, that's just because no one pushed their buttons, right? But it was nonetheless true that they had the disposition. They were still, you know, on the edge during that whole day, even if they never exploded. Okay, so now that we have the notion of a disposition, we're able to revise our understanding of the behaviorist theory so that it's no longer the claim that you know, being in a mental state just is exhibiting some behavior, it's now going to avoid the, the counterexample. It's now going to avoid the counterexample by being changed. We're going to change the theory. We're going to alter the version of behaviorism. We're going to present a new version. And this version is going to be immune to the previous counterexample. Here's a statement of the new revised version of behaviorism. Behaviorism is the theory that mental states are dispositions to behave in certain ways. So it was pointed out in the counterexample, right, that it's possible for someone to be angry, but not, you know, punch or cry or yell or anything like that. So it can't be that anger just is that anger behavior. Instead, according to this version of behaviorism, this more sophisticated version, anger is certain dispositions to exhibit anger behavior, right? So the idea is that even though someone doesn't, you know, yell out or punch, maybe they're ready to yell out or punch, and that's what anger is. Anger is the idea that if the right thing hits you at the right time, you'll punch, something like that. Here is Armstrong's statement of this more sophisticated version of behaviorism, which happens on page 297 in the reading. The glass does not shatter, but it is still brittle. The man does not behave, but he does have a disposition to behave. We can say he thinks, although he does not speak or act, because at that time he was disposed to speak or act in a certain way. If he had been asked, perhaps, he would have spoken or acted. We can say he is angry, although he does not behave angrily, because he is disposed so to behave. If only one more word had been addressed to him, he would have burst out. That's the more sophisticated version of behaviorism, and it avoids the initial counterexample that doomed the less sophisticated, crude version of behaviorism. Okay, so for next time, we're going to read an article by Hilary Putnam, which attacks even the more sophisticated version of behaviorism. But before we get to that 
you know, sort of larger attack on behaviorism, I want to say something in favor of it. Remember that on Descartes' theory of the mind, the dualist theory, the mind was private. It was something that the person with the mind has special access to, right? The idea is that I feel a certain way and I know that I feel that way and you might not know unless I tell you or unless I, I let it out or express that feeling or that state of my mind um, in some way that you can see. You might think that behaviorism runs into a certain problem with this because behavior is outwardly visible. And so behaviorism would seem to suggest that the mind is not something private that the, that the agent knows more directly than other people, but instead is something that anyone can know as much as anyone else. And that might seem like a problem, but I want to suggest that maybe the mind isn't so private after all. Maybe you don't have such special access to your own mental states. Take, for example, jealousy. Is that how you spell jealousy? I hope so. Anyway, you don't think you're jealous. As far as you know, right, as far as your access to your own mind goes, you're not jealous. But there you are, breathing heavily, sitting in a parked car at 3 a.m., staring out at their closed front door. Maybe you're actually jealous. And maybe other people, someone who saw you exhibiting this behavior, maybe they would know that you're jealous. Maybe they would know your own mind better than you know your own mind. If that seems plausible to you, if, if it seems possible to you that someone else can know your mental states better than you can know your own mental states, well then maybe behaviorism isn't so crazy.